Good morning and welcome to worship at Presbyterian Church of the Eternal Hills in Tabernash, Colorado. Today is World Communion Sunday, a day when we celebrate communion across the globe. We thank you for joining us today. And if this is your first time joining us during a communion service, we invite you to pause and go gather your communion elements so that you can enjoy the meal after the, um, after the prayer. Today, I remind you that this is the culmination of the Peace and Global Witness offering, and we were focusing on kindness for the past month. The, the month of September, we talked about uh, Mr. Rogers and the way he lived out his faith in kindness and taught children and adults alike how to love one another uh, by inviting everyone to be our neighbors. And today, for World Communion Sunday, we remember that our neighbors are all around the globe. If you'd like to make an offering to the Peace and Global Witness offering, you can do so by mailing your check to Church of the Eternal Hills and make sure you notate that it's for the Peace and Global Witness offering. 25% of that offering stays right here in Grand County. And this year we've chosen our own counseling center and scholarships to uh, be benefited from this. We have a soup supper coming up, and it is a fundraiser for our preschool. Our Eternal Hills Christian Preschool provides needed child care and early childhood education for many children from Greene County. We work very hard to make sure our children are loved and that they feel safe whenever they are within our building. We do uh, need to raise funds because the cost of tuition uh, doesn't really cover our teacher and staff salaries. So. Uh, if you would please consider donating for the preschool, that would be awesome. And you can also do that and, and buy some soup at the same time. There are details in your bulletin. And don't forget, you can download a bulletin from our website. And it's a link that has a brand new bulletin on it every Sunday morning. Now, let us put our hearts and minds uh, to focus on God as we listen to this prelude. Grace and peace to you in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Oh God, our amazing creator, we thank you for bringing us here today and we ask a special blessing upon those who are worshiping in our building today. As we gather like people across the globe for communion on this day, help us to be mindful of our brothers and sisters all over. Help us to be mindful of one another as we wear our masks and uh, keep our hands washed and clean. And, oh God, please direct our ways 
so that our worship will be pleasing to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, today we do have a special celebration, uh, and it has to do with this place that we come every week to to begin our worship service, a place where we lift up to God our burdens and our heartbreaks, our grief, and anything that really keeps us separated or puts a breach between God and our hearts. As we enter into worship today, I invite you now into this time of silent worship where you can lift up to God those places where you know you have just missed the mark this week. We pray. God's grace poured out for you. As you hear this refreshing sound, know the truth that in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins have been forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Now may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. As we center ourselves around this baptismal font, we have an opportunity to celebrate a baptism this week. During the season of COVID, we haven't been sure how we can do that and keep the child and the parents and the pastor and whoever is there safe. And so our session gave leeway to be able to baptize outside of our building and privately. Because we're of the Reformed tradition, we believe that baptisms are for the entire community and that all who come are a part of that baptism and a part of recognizing God's working and saving power through the church, this body of Christ. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. I had the distinct pleasure of baptizing Owen William Gones, son of Courtney and Aaron Gones, and grandson of Matt and Susan Nixon. Now, part of the baptismal promise is the congregation being able to welcome that child into the fellowship of being a part of our family um, and really part of the larger body of Christ. In the Reformed tradition, we say there are is no such thing as a private baptism because we know that what we're doing is truly bringing this child into a community. But during this time of COVID, we've been concerned with how do we keep the baby safe? How do we keep the pastor, the parents, and and anybody who is there safe from um, exposing one another in case one or sick? So the session has given us leniency to do baptisms outside of the church, perhaps outside in nature or at the home of the parents or grandparents. We were able to celebrate on the front porch of Matt and Susan's home in Tabernash, and it was a beautiful afternoon, and little Owen did terrific. He bowed his head in wonderful reverence as I poured the water over his head. I do have to apologize. We don't have video footage of that, but here are some pictures of that wonderful event. As you look at the pictures of this happy family, I will invite you to respond in the way that congregations respond during the baptism service. Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, wherever you may be, 
promised to guide and nurture Aaron and Courtney as they raise Owen, to guide by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging them to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of the church. And the people respond, we do. Thank you. Let us pray. Faithful God, in baptism you claimed us, and by your spirit you are at work in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading Aaron and Courtney to this time and place, to have Owen baptized, and to affirm the covenant you make with all of us in our baptism. Establish us in your truth, guide us by your spirit, that together with all your people, we may grow in faith, hope, and love, and be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we turn our hearts to scripture, I want to take a moment to thank all of you who have given so generously and encourage you to continue to send in your pledges. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for the generosity of your disciples, and we ask that we might use these gifts for the betterment of your kingdom, that our rulers and elders in this congregation would listen that they might discern your will, not only for these gifts, but for this building and for these worship services that we are presenting. In your name we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise you, all creatures here. God, quiet our hearts and minds so that we may not be distracted from your living word and that we may hear it fresh and new. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. This is a scripture not just about God's relationship with Israel in the time of Isaiah, but God's relationship with Israel across history. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. I'll sing a ballad to the one I love, a love ballad about his vineyard. The one I love had a vineyard, a fine, well-placed vineyard. He hoed the soil and pulled the weeds and planted the very best vines. He built a lookout, built a wine press, a vineyard to be proud of. He looked for a vintage yield of grapes, but for all his pains, he got junk grapes. Now listen to what I'm telling you, you who live in Jerusalem and Judah. What do you think is going on between me and my vineyard? Can you think of anything I could have done to my vineyard that I didn't do? When I expected good grapes, why did I get bitter grapes? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. Here's another story. Listen closely. There was once a man, a wealthy farmer, who planted a vineyard. He fenced it, dug a wine press, put up a watchtower, then turned it over to the farmhands and went off on a trip. When it was time to harvest the grapes, he sent his servants back to collect his profits. The farmhands grabbed the first servant and beat him up. The next one they murdered. They threw stones at the third, but he got away. 
the owner tried again, sending more servants. They got the same treatment. The owner was at the end of his rope. He decided to send his son. Surely, he thought, they will respect my son. But when the farmhands saw the son arrive, they rubbed their hands in greed. This is the heir. Let's kill him and have it all for ourselves. They grabbed him, threw him out, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard arrives, now, when the owner of the vineyard arrives home from his trip, what do you think he will do to the farmhands? He'll kill them, a rotten bunch and good riddance, they answered. Then he'll assign the vineyard to farmhands who will hand over the profits when it's time. Jesus said, right, and you can read it for yourselves in your Bibles. The stone the masons threw out is now the cornerstone. This is God's work. We rub our eyes. We can hardly believe it. This is the way it is with you. God's kingdom will be taken back from you and handed over to a people who will live out a kingdom life. Whoever stumbles on this stone gets shattered. Whoever the stone falls on gets smashed. When religious leaders heard the story, they knew it was aimed at them. They wanted to arrest Jesus and put him in jail, but intimidated by public opinion, they held back. Most people held him to be a prophet of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing and acceptable unto you, O God. For you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Anyone who knows anything about parables knows that this is an important one. Jesus says, open your ears, anyone who has ears to hear. In other words, hey, pay attention. Something important is coming. I don't think it took much of a need for him to say pay attention because he used this word vineyard. A word that since the days of Isaiah and probably before that, Israel had considered itself to be the vineyard of God. The chosen people living in covenant with God. That meant that God gave them a part of the bargain and they followed it through. The unfortunate part about that reading from Isaiah is that they weren't following through on their part of the bargain. God had provided this land for them and had asked them to produce fruit. And he said, why is it that all I get are bitter grapes, sour grapes? There's nothing like it when you're expecting a, a big, plump, juicy, sweet grape to put in your mouth one that isn't quite ripe and it's sour or bitter and, the, and it just tastes awful. You want to spit it out. That must be how God feels over and again when God's people turn away or choose to do their own thing. It's the story in our Hebrew scriptures that we hear from the very beginning of time, how God's people living in covenant choose to disobey or turn away or kind of forget that God is giving them guidance and has provided for them this vineyard. And what they're called to do is to raise those grapes and make good fruit. Jesus brings to the forefront of all of their minds, this illusion from Isaiah. And he takes it a step farther. He says that anyone whom the owner of the vineyard sends, those people who are watching the land murder and kill. They have become so greedy with their land and what they believe they deserve that they forget gratitude they forget that God provided it for them in the first place. I wonder, what is the vineyard nowadays? The pe people of Israel knew right away what God was talking about. And they even knew and recognized the voices of the prophets when Jesus said, the servants, they murdered, and put to death. And look at how Jesus was shortly treated after that, or treated shortly after that. He too was put to death by a government that saw him as a rebel rouser. 
Someone who had come to help get that vineyard back in shape instead was being torn away from the vineyard to a place where he couldn't really affect the way they were trying to produce fruit. Today, who are the servants? And what is the fruit? Are we now tending the vineyard well? I kind of think in our lives as Christians, we need to recognize that the vineyard is our life in Christ, the kingdom of heaven that God wants for everyone, where justice prevails and where we listen to God's direction and our hearts are attuned to the very heart of God. I'm afraid that we resemble more those people who tear down those servants and put to death the son. In the story, the son really becomes a martyr. And I wonder who in today's government and in today's politics and in today's global scene, who is that martyr? Who is that son? We need to remember that we are called not to be the ones that tear everything down once it comes into the vineyard, but rather we're the ones who are supposed to open those gates and make that land livable. We need to remember that God calls us throughout scriptures to be the repairers of the breach, the breach that exists between God and creation. So no matter what that looks like, we have to put ourselves in the place of those who are building up rather than tearing down, which is why we find ourselves here at this table. It was at a table very much like this that the very first building began. It was after some disciples had taken a long road to Emmaus. They were going to tell their brothers and sisters there in the community that had been following Jesus that his body was missing from the tomb and that some of the women had seen him and, and then that he had appeared to the 12 later. They were walking on the road and a stranger joined them and he asked why they were so downhearted. The disciples said that their Lord had died. He had been put to death by the Roman government and they were on their way to share that. And as if that wasn't bad enough, they said. His body has been taken. It was missing. And they don't know where he has been. But the risen Lord has appeared to Mary and some of the women. And again to some of the disciples. The stranger followed them. And began to share with them the story of God's people. Of a vineyard that God had planted for Israel. And how Israel time and again had turned away. And how when God sent his only son, they turned away from him as well. And that he had died only to be risen again. As the disciples walked with this man, this stranger, their hearts began to burn inside of them. And it was as if they understood the entire allegory of the vineyard and of the people who had been placed in charge to care for that vineyard. They began to understand what it meant for there to be bitter grapes. When they arrived at the house they were headed to, they invited the stranger to join them and to sit at table with them. And it was then that he took his place, took the bread, blessed it, and broke it. And he gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they saw the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ there in their midst. And then he was gone. They stood dumbfounded, not sure what to do for a while. But then one of them took up the bread, blessed it and broke it and told about how the night of his arrest, Jesus did this gave the bread to them and said, this is my body given for you. Take it and eat it and remember me. Then another took the cup, thanked God for it and poured it out saying, and this, 
This is the cup of the new covenant that God has made. And it is not bitter grapes. This is good, good wine. And it stands for the forgiveness of sins. And they knew that every time they would share the cup and the bread, they would be proclaiming Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the risen Lord. And they did this time and again as they began to build the church, the body of Christ, the body that had been broken was now being put back together in a building event the world has never seen. Person after person shared the bread and the cup and proclaimed their forgiveness by the grace of God. And the story passed through history. And it came to the United States of America where it spread from east to west And the people built churches and began to celebrate communion and proclaim forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. But we have to pause and remember that that building somehow, somewhere along the way began to be corrupted. And so now we find ourselves in a time when the body of Christ is so divided and splintered again that the disciples may be asking, where is our risen Lord? And so we claim that we are under construction. We are all going to gather at the table today. We are going to share the bread and the cup, and we're going to begin to remember or reassemble the body of Christ. And we're going to do it from the cornerstone up. As our gospel reading said that, Stone which the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone for this body of Christ. It is Christ. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your story and for sending your son Jesus to us to show us the way. To give of us his body and to share with us that cup of forgiveness that we have so longed for. Today, as we and other Christians around the globe gather to remember the body of Christ. Help us to begin rebuilding your church in a time when the world needs it more than ever, O Lord. We ask that we might do the job well, that we might be anointed for this calling, and that we may listen for the way that you would have us preach your word and share your love. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these simple elements of bread and cup that they might be for us the very things we need to remember the body of Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today, as you depart worship, I want you to remember we are not closing with a benediction because our work is not done. The building that began at this table so long ago in a home in Emmaus by the master builder himself is now upon us to be shared and built again. So as you share your communion with whoever you're sharing it with today, a beloved partner, your family, perhaps a pet, Perhaps you are surrounded by those saints of all times and all places. May you know that this week we begin again. We begin anew. We remember that God has tasked us to be repairers of the breach. So let us go forth to continue worshiping and to continue building. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.
worship you. I worship you. Stop. 